Hi. You've chosen a Gritzner Overlock, the Gritzner 788, and you're probably excited to see what you can do with your awesome new machine. I'm Manu from Curly's, and I've been dealing with little else but overlock machines and cover machines for the past 20 years. I give courses all over the country between Hamburg and Zurich, and for a few years now there have also been Curly's videos. The special thing about the Curly's videos is that I naturally address all the questions and topics that come up in the courses and the videos so that you can see everything very clearly. It's as if you were standing next to me in a real course. And we don't cut away when it gets difficult. We keep on filming. Because the things that happen to us here during filming, or of course also during private sewing, will happen to you at home too. I'll guide you through your entire machine. That means we'll look at how to thread it exactly. We'll look at needles and thread. We'll see what stitches you can make. And we'll start with the included accessories. In your box, you have found a user manual. This manual is important because you can quickly find all the important information and refer to it easily. Even if you are going to a sewing meeting or to a friend's place, simply pack the user manual with you. Then you can be sure that you will be able to solve and set up every little thing. You have a pair of tweezers that will help you especially when threading. You have this small Allen wrench that you need to insert and remove the needles. Then you have the screwdriver that you need to loosen the stitch plate when you want to clean underneath it. You have the brush to brush everything out. It also helps when inserting the needles. This small converter here, which was in a plastic sleeve, you need whenever you want to make a stitch without the upper looper, for example, for two threaded stitches. Then you have machine oil. Machine oil for sewing machines and overlockers is particularly light and a little thinner. And it flows exactly where it should, so only use that and no other oil. You have these thread spool stoppers that you always put on your thread spools when they are too light and there is a risk that they will jump up while sewing. You have the waste bin that you click onto the front of your machine so that all the waste and cuttings can go in. Thread spool nets. You need these whenever your cone is perhaps already a little emptier or a little loosely wound. They are there to hold the thread on the cone so that it does not fall down and perhaps get caught underneath. Then we have here the power cable and your foot pedal connected together a cover, a dust cover with which you can protect your machine from dust when you are not using it, and five small feet were also included in your machine. This is the blind stitch foot, next to it the sequin foot, the elastic foot, the piping foot, and right on the edge, the ruffler foot. Also, a small package was included in your machine's accessories, and we will start with the question of the needles first. When your machine is delivered, woven fabric needles are already inserted. That means if your first project is made of woven fabric, you can just leave the needles in and start right away. But if your first project is made of knit fabric, you need to change the needles. Why should you change the needles? Because if you sew knit fabrics with woven fabric needles, you will have small holes at the stitches. And over time, especially after the first or second wash, these holes will be very noticeable. The difference between woven and knit fabric needles is in the tip. The tip of the woven fabric needle is sharp, while the tip of the knit fabric needle is slightly rounded. Like when knitting, the stitches are simply displaced. This means you can use the same needles in your machine that you use on your sewing machine. Because the needles that are already inside are universal needles. If you want to sew a thin silk or a batiste or organza, you can also use microtex needles in your machine. But whenever you use knit fabric, you must either use the included HA needles or use jersey or super stretch needles. What is the difference between HA needles and jersey needles? The HA needles simply have a slightly larger eye and are therefore a little bit easier to thread. Also, no matter what project you are working on, always make sure you have the right needle size inserted because the wrong needle size can ruin your seam, just like the wrong needle type. If you have the wrong needle type and the wrong needle size in your machine for the project, you can operate your machine as well as you want, but you won't get a clean seam, so pay attention to the type and size. The larger the number, the thicker the needle. 
that means a 70 needle is significantly thinner than a 90 needle. Finally, regarding the needles, if you use very thin needles, such as 70 Microtex for Organza, it is recommended to sew very slowly with the machine because the machine rattles very quickly. And if you sew very fast, the needles move a little bit back and forth, and there is a very high risk that a needle will break. We will now change the needles before threading from the woven fabric needles that are already inserted to the included HA80 needles. But before we do that, let's first take a look at what all the buttons, hooks, and levers on your machine are really for. Let's start with the things you have on the left side of your machine. Here at the back is your differential. Differential is not a small replacement part or something the mechanic can install and uninstall, but it refers to the ability to run your front and rear feed dogs at different speeds differentially. If your differential is set to one, then you have even feed. That means the fabric is transported to the back at the same speed as it is transported to the front under the foot with the feed dog. But sometimes fabric comes out wavy when it shouldn't be. For such situations, you have the differential. You go to the upper part of the differential, and the further up you go, the more the fabric is pushed together. This means that the wave is counteracted between the foot and feed dog, resulting in smooth fabric at the back. The further you go up in the upper area, the more your fabric is pushed together, which means that you can curl excellently in differential too. The opposite is true if you go to the lower area of the differential. Sometimes you sew very thin fabrics such as silk, organza, and batiste, and they come out of the machine lying flat and you want to stretch them a bit because they are a bit squashed. For this, you use the differential in the lower area. In the lower area, the fabric is pulled slightly back out of the machine, making it taut under the machine, and the result that comes out at the end is really smooth. With this, you regulate your stitch length. As a rule of thumb, the coarser your fabric, the longer your stitch can be. And the finer your fabric, the shorter your stitch can be. You wouldn't sew silk with a stitch length of four, and you wouldn't sew jeans with a stitch length of one. This lever is used to engage or disengage your blade. It is engaged here, flush with the stitch plate, and is not in use. When you disengage it, it does not immediately fall down, but you have to push it down with your finger. When you re-engage it, it automatically comes up in the next stitch you sew. There are very few situations where you should fold the knife away. The danger of sewing without a knife is always that you have placed your fabric piece over the knife edge, and the further your perhaps thick fabric covers the knife edge beyond the actual cutting edge, the greater the risk that your loopers will break because the thread delivery is simply based on laying a clean seam around your cutting edge. If you now move too far to the right, especially with thick fabrics, there is a real danger that your loopers will break. Here at the front, you have your stitch width dial. With the stitch width dial, you regulate the distance between your knife cutting edge and your inserted needles. Turn it from right to left and from left to right, and you will see how your knife moves towards and away from the needles. As a rule of thumb, I would recommend that the coarser your fabric, the wider your stitch can be. And the finer your fabric, the narrower your stitch can be. Here you see an example of a narrow seam and here an example of a wide seam. All of this combined means that you can sew jeans with a wide and long stitch, while you sew your silk or organza with a narrow and closer stitch. Let's look a little higher up on the same side of the machine. Then we have the presser foot lifter here, with which you can raise and lower the presser foot and we have a little button here at the back. And when your presser foot is up, you can press the button and your presser foot will drop down. This is a perfect way to remove the foot. Personally, I always like to thread all my machines with the presser foot removed because you have the best view of the threading process around the needles and also around the knife and plate. You don't have to slalom your threads around the knife foot and stitch plate, but you can simply lay the threads to the side, pull them back, and then reattach the foot at the end. If you want to move the presser foot to the side now, simply pull it to the left. If you want to reattach it, bring it forward here, place it exactly under the foot holder with the small ledge, lower your presser foot, and it should snap in immediately. If it doesn't, press this little button at the back, and it will snap in immediately. And last but not least, you have your free arm here on this side of the machine, which you can use if you don't want to sew backwards, but just want to stay in front and push forward in small pieces. Let's turn to the right side of your machine, where you have three options where you can have an impact. 
Firstly, there is your power button, and behind it, your power cord or foot pedal. With the Gritzner, it is important to note that as soon as you turn it on, it would start sewing the moment you press the foot pedal. This means in practice, if you accidentally press the pedal, the needles will start. That means the machine starts sewing. Therefore, the tip, always turn off the machine when you change the needles. Always when you work on the needles with your fingers here, I can only recommend that you turn off the machine because it actually happens relatively quickly that you accidentally touch the foot pedal. With the front cover open, the Gritzner cannot sew because there is a small safety switch installed on the side. And as long as the cover is open, you cannot start the machine with the foot pedal. You also have your tension release button here on the right side. And when we start talking about the tension release button, we're actually already talking about thread tension because thread tension works like this. If you have set the thread tension to nine, then your tension discs are pressing hard against each other. Take a thread, hold it between your fingers, press hard together, pull it in front. Then you will notice that the thread is very difficult to pull out of your fingers. At thread tension zero, the plates are not completely open, so you can't pull out the thread, but they still touch lightly. With the Gritzner, you don't have a tension release when you lift the presser foot. With the Gritzner, you only have a tension release when you push in the tension release button here. Only then do your tension plates open completely and the thread can slip in when threading or be pulled out easily when unthreading. That means you can move your threads manually most easily when you press this button here. You also have your hand wheel here on the right side which turns towards you when the machine is running. Let's now look at what you actually find inside your machine. We have two fixed loopers. One is the upper looper, this one here. In the seam, the upper looper is either above or next to the stitch plate, but never below it. This is your lower looper. In the seam, the lower looper is either under the stitch plate or next to it, but never above it. Why is it important to know this exactly? At some point in your sewing life, probably sooner rather than later, you will come to the point where you have to adjust individual threads. And then it is very important that you know exactly which thread actually comes from where in your seam. Is it a looper thread? Is it a needle thread? And if it's a looper, is it the upper or lower looper? But if you know that your upper looper is always up and your lower looper is always down and you look at your needles, your needles go into the fabric, are wrapped by the upper and lower loopers, Come back up, the feed dog transports your fabric to the back, and the needles go back in. That means your needle threads always lie on top. And since we just looked, and the upper looper is always up or next to the stitch plate, let's now look at a seam, and then we can see exactly that we have two needle threads on this side compared to this side. So this must be your top side. If we now know through the needle threads what your top side is, it is of course logical that this is your upper looper and the other one is your lower looper. If you are only sewing with one needle, you can remember it differently. Your lower looper makes letters for you, namely Ys or Vs. Then you have two knives on your machine, the movable upper knife and the immovable lower knife. The movements of the upper knife down on the immovable lower knife result in a kind of scissor function. If you accidentally sew over a needle, it is actually in 90% of cases that your upper knife has a small edge and then you no longer have a really clean seam. If it goes really wrong, even your lower knife has to be replaced. That's why I can only recommend that you avoid pins as much as possible when using the overlock until you are really confident and until then, use clips instead. You regulate your knife width, which we have already talked about, with your stitch width dial. Then you have your finger here at the front. I actually like to call it a rolled hem finger or stitch width finger. You regulate your rolled hem finger with this small white hook here. If you go to N, your stitch width finger is folded forward. If you go to R, your stitch width finger is retracted. What is your stitch width finger for exactly? Imagine these are your two loopers, upper and lower looper, and your stitch width finger is in between. Your machine dispenses the thread and your stitch width finger, which is pushed forward, stabilizes your seam, and can wrap itself cleanly around the edge. If you now retract the stitch width finger and increase the thread tension a bit, for example, 
the fabric around the edge could be pulled because the stabilizer is missing in the seam. This also explains why there is a small R and an N here at the front. R stands for rolled hem. And whenever you want to make a rolled hem, you pull your stitch width finger back. Then in conjunction with an increase in thread tension, your fabric can be folded or the folded rolled hem can be created. And last but not least, we have your presser foot pressure up here with which you can regulate how hard your foot presses on your fabric, and together the fabric is transported to the back with the feed dog. The coarser your fabric, the stronger your presser foot pressure can be set, and the softer, finer, and more delicate your fabric is, the looser you can make it. You increase it by turning it clockwise to the back, to the right, and if you turn it counterclockwise to the left, you reduce the presser foot pressure. After all this theory, which is really important in order to be able to handle all sorts of materials, we now turn to threading. When threading the machine, it is very important to make sure that the arm is completely extended. And since we want to change the threads and needles, we first cut the threads in front of the tension. What we have in front of us is the tension, and at the back is the tension wheel. To remove the threads from the machine, there are different ways. Unfortunately, I often hear that sewers are advised to sew empty, meaning just press the gas pedal. This implies that the needle is empty on the transporter. The more it does that, the more the small transporter teeth dig into your foot and eventually leave deep grooves that can make it difficult to sew fine fabrics. So I strongly advise you not to do that. Sometimes they are also advised to hold the thread chain at the back and pull it out by holding the presser foot up. I have had very bad experiences with this in classes because the ladies often only hold the chain and don't pull it. Then the machine sews in place and you actually have an almost insoluble tangle of threads. That's why I always do it differently. You open your machine. And now we remember that the Gritzner doesn't have a tension release when you lift the presser foot, but it has a tension release when you press this button on the side. So you take a pair of tweezers, press the button, and go directly behind the tension where the threads come out at the bottom and pull the two threads of the grippers forward and then pull the two threads of the needles forward in this round path. When it comes to how your tensions are arranged, you have your left needle here, your right needle there, your upper looper here, and your lower looper there. So we first pulled the two grippers out of the machine and then the two needles. Now you can simply grasp your thread chain at the back. And if you can't pull it straight back like I can here, then you take your hand wheel. So if you still have a chain there, you take your hand wheel, turn it forward, until your needles are on their way up again. The moment they are already on their way up again, turn the hand wheel back, and just before the needles are all the way up, you can simply pull the thread straight back. Sometimes the threads get stuck a little on the chain tongues, then you just do the same thing again. At the latest, after the second time, you have all the threads in your hand and can simply pull them straight back. It's important that you pull at 12 o'clock and not sideways. This is exactly like the cover, always pull back and never to the left. Now to change the needles, we do that before we change the threads. We first remove the presser foot so that we can see better at the front. Then you turn the hand wheel so that your gripper disappears in front of the needles and you have free access to the needles. Then you take your small brush that has the hole on the side and stick it from below into the needle. This ensures that your needles don't disappear downwards in the stitch plate when you release them. Then you take your hex key and remove the needles from the top. And that's exactly how you put the needles back in. You have to make sure that the flat part faces away from you, towards the back of the machine. First, go down into the stitch plate with the needle and then straight up. You must make sure that both needles are all the way up. I like to hold both needles again with my fingers. Release both, push them all the way up, and then turn them really tight. Now that we have emptied the machine and changed the needles, we can finally start threading. 
we take off the threads that came with the machine. And if you want to work with those big overlock cones, you could just put them on top now and leave those little hats on them. Because with the hats, the big cones have a really good grip. But we want to work with the smaller cones. And if you put the smaller cones on these hats, they flutter back and forth. They don't really have a good grip. So now we take the hats off the machine. You also immediately see something that can happen to you at home. When you take off the large cones, sometimes these hats get stuck in the cones. If they don't come out properly, just stick tweezers in from above and they will shoot out from below. Just put the small cones on the machine without the hats. And since we're working with the smaller cones now, you can put the thread roll stoppers on the holder from above. When threading, make sure to thread the upper looper first, then the lower looper, then the left needle, and then the right needle. First, the thread goes into the tension here at the front, then you let it run down here. When the thread comes out from above, you can orient yourself by the points. With your upper looper thread, you always have to go through the green-blue point markings. This means that with this one, you only go through the upper one. Then you pull the thread over here and then go through the upper looper. The next one is your lower looper. The lower looper also needs to go into the tension at the back then run through here and come out here at the bottom. With your lower looper, you follow the yellow markings. That means you go in here first. Then you have the yellow markings on both sides. Here you also have to go under both. Then you drive through this holder, through there, and then your thread hangs here at the front. With the lower loopers of the overlockers, the thread must always come from the back left if it wants to go through the lower looper. There are all kinds of variations, even machines where you still have to thread manually here. Now thread it through the lower looper, hold it here, then take it from above and hold it away a bit with your finger. Now it goes through the two hooks through here and then directly into the eye. And then you take it and simply put it behind these two hooks from here. That's where it belongs. Now you can apply a little tension with your fingers up here. Go here, take this hook, push it back with your fingers, and your lower looper stays exactly where it should be. Now you can see why I like to remove the foot when threading, because you can now simply put the thread from here behind the knife and just pull it straight back. And then you have your two gripper threads exactly where you want them. After the gripper threads, we thread the needle threads last. Just like the grippers, the needle threads are also hanging in the arm here. And we start with the left needle thread. You put the thread into the tension up here, drive through the tension wheel here, Go behind this silver hook up here through this holder and then come out over the needle thread. Then you put your needle thread directly over the needles behind this silver clip and thread it through the eye. Thread the right needle thread in the same way, up into the tension through the tension wheel through the silver hook here. From here, the two needle threads follow their threading path over the silver holder and then into the eye. Now we threaded with the presser foot up, but we didn't even touch our tension button, our tension lifter button. I've gotten into the habit of always pressing the lifter at the end because otherwise I might not know after each individual thread, did I press the lifter now or not? So I leave it completely out. Once I've threaded all the threads, I take all the threads from behind, press the button, pull on all the threads at the same time, and then all four threads slide into the tensions at the same time. And I can now be sure that all the threads are exactly where they should be. Now we attach the presser foot, close the machine, 
and attach the waste bin in front of it. To make your waste bin click, just like mine, take your bin. It has two small elevations at the front. And you sort of lever it under the machine or push it sideways under the machine as if you wanted to lift the machine a little with these two elevations. Then it always clicks exactly as it should. I also like to use it as a surface for my small clips. Then I always know where I have them. After all these explanations, we can finally start our first seam. But all this theory is super important because the market offers so many different materials. And you have such a great machine on which you can adjust so many things and actually prepare yourself for every fabric and process every fabric really well so that over time, all the connections will close more and more and you will understand more and more why you should use this stitch length for this fabric and maybe this differential for that fabric. First, we have jersey fabric, which we have used with HA needles. The tension settings on my machine are all set to four. My presser foot is at the back. My differential is set to one. My stitch length is at 2.5. My knife is raised. And my stitch width is at six. I mention the raised knife specifically because if you end a seam and start a new one, make sure to begin with the knife raised. If necessary, turn the hand wheel towards yourself until the knife is at the top. Why? Because you place the fabrics behind the knife, then you give it gas. At the moment you start sewing, the knife cuts through both layers of fabric, and the fabric is transported smoothly to the back. Unfortunately, I often see that ladies do not care where their knife is located. That means both fabrics will eventually hit the knife, and in the worst case, your knife is down. Now the fabrics come to the knife, your knife goes up. And the thicker your fabric, the higher the chance your knife will lift your fabric. But your bottom fabric will continue to move forward. That means in the best case, you have just a shift. In the worst case, your top fabric is folded. That's why I place my fabric in front, lift my presser foot just a bit, push my jersey fabric to the back under the knife, and begin sewing. It's absolutely unnecessary to sew a chain stitch before starting to sew because that means you're dragging your foot over the feed dog. So I just take my starting threads, hold them here at the back for the first two or three stitches, and then start sewing. And now you can see that I always have these two fingers at the level of the foot and move them. No matter what fabric, whether thick or thin, with the machine to the back at the speed at which the machine is sewing. You can't sew your fingers because the feet at the front have a knife guard. That means you can save yourself from having to adjust the presser foot pressure because you can simply regulate how your fabrics are pushed back with these two fingers, the middle finger and the ring finger. If you get used to pressing your fingers correctly on the side of the fabric and taking them to the back at the same speed, you will always have a great result. And then your seam comes out of the machine. The seam is not good, but it's not really bad either. What's noticeable is it's wonderfully even, but also noticeable it's very tight. That means if your seam comes out so tight, you should first increase your stitch length to extend the distance from here to there a bit. It's very nice that we don't have any loop excesses at the top, but it's bad that it's so wavy. And we are now talking about this waviness because we have landed in the deepest depths of the differential. Earlier when we talked about the differential, I said that the differential is responsible for the differential speed of your feed dogs. We have sewn at one. That means the fabric was pushed in at the front at the same speed as it was pulled out at the back. If we now go to the upper area of the differential, the rear feed dog will not push the fabric out to the back quite as quickly as it is pushed in at the front, which means that your fabric is compressed and the wave is smoothed out.
And what we see here now is an absolutely even super dreamy seam. The stitches are a bit apart because we increase the stitch length and we have absolutely no more wave formation because we brought the differential to the upper area. And when unfolded, the seam looks like this. I want to stay with you for just a moment longer with this seam before we move on to further problems that might arise, such as too loose underfeed, too tight needle, and such things. Because I now have four Ackerman overlock threads in my machine. The Ackerman overlock threads, the 120S, are almost a bit fluffy, like fluffy yarn. If we were to make the identical seam with a normal overlock thread, which is a bit thinner. We would of course have stitches that are further apart than the ones I have here in our first seam with the original stitch length because your thread is thinner. So you absolutely have to pay attention to that and that's why I'm not a fan of universal rules or statements like always do it this way or that way. You have to pay attention to how thick your thread is. The thicker your thread, the longer you have to choose your stitch. But it depends on what kind of seam you want to make. Because you want a rolled hem to be relatively dense, but a normal four thread overlock seam not so much. Now let's look at the effects on the seam when your tension is not correct. Here we have a seam where the underfeed is much too loose. You can see here are the needle threads. The underfeed is clearly pulled to the upper feed dog side. That means the underfeed actually has no tension, in this case, zero and is pulled to the upper side by the upper feed dog. In this example, we have an underfeed that is much too tight. The underfeed pulls the upper feed dog around the corner and we only have a very small amount of thread from the underfeed. The underfeed was set to nine in this case. And you can also see very clearly here that the left needle is pulled down to the lower side by the high underfeed tension. The underfeed was set to nine in this case. If your upper feed dog is not correct, it will be pulled around the corner by the underfeed as shown here. And if your upper feed dog is too tight, it will pull the underfeed up. Let's look at incorrect needle thread tensions. Here we see a very loose right needle which is indicated by the loops welding at the underfeed on the underside. A needle that is too tight, just like a left needle that is too tight, makes small pleats between the individual needles. That means the needle threads pull together a little bit and the fabric tries to come up in between. You can clearly see a loose left needle by the needle threads when you unfold the fabric. Needle threads that are too tight always dig deep into the fabric. Here I have now made an example for you with the presser foot up. That means I manually pass the fabric under the open presser foot. You can see that the stitches are relatively uneven and the upper and under feed are not in their proper place. That means you didn't sew with the correct thread tension. On page 28-29 of your instructions, you will find other possible errors in the thread tension. Here, I have sewn the result from the middle of page 29. The solution is, increase the tension on the upper feed or loosen the tension on the under feed, but it always depends on your current tension. That means if you have a seam like this where the underfeed comes up, I have now sewn with left right needle 4, upper feed 4, underfeed 2.5. You can see that the underfeed comes up. In this situation with this seam result, I would increase the underfeed a bit. It always depends on your seam result and with which tensions you have just sewn. Ultimately, we could spend the whole day talking about thread tension, but we don't want to. We want to continue looking through the machine and the seams it offers us. In the Curly's videos on various topics, I always deal with the topic of thread tension over and over again because the topic of thread tension is something you have to deal with during your entire sewing time. The more comfortable you are with it, 
the easier it is for you to set up your machine without having to write or look up questions. But there is one thing I would like to look at with you here, and that is this seam. We already talked about the problem earlier. But at this point, the seam is even worse than up front. What happened there? I have the thread stoppers on my machine here. My thread actually got stuck on these thread stoppers on the upper feed dog. That can happen simply because threads unwind differently. And again, we are in an area where there are no generalizations. Sometimes it's good to use the stoppers, just like the nets, and sometimes it's better to leave them out. I have now removed them from my upper and under feed. So let's continue to look at the other seams of the machine. So far, we've used the four thread overlock stitch, also known as the overlock stitch. Whenever you want to sew knit fabrics like a sweater or a shirt or a hoodie or whatever made of jersey, sweat, fleece, French terry, that is knit fabrics, you use the four thread overlock stitch. It holds your fabric together well and is still stretchy. If we take out one needle, we have the finishing seam. It is as long as the upper and lower loopers are in consistent tension. That means, as long as the threads interlace right at the knife edge, we have a consistent overlock seam. This is also commonly referred to as a finishing seam because it can be used to finish edges of woven fabrics. For woven fabrics, you need universal needles. If you were to remove both needles and only insert the right one as a universal needle, you could finish a lighter woven fabric and then sew it together on a sewing machine. If you insert the left needle as a universal needle and leave the right one out, you could finish coarser materials such as jeans or canvas. Now, I'm going to take out both of my HA needles, insert the right needle as a universal needle again, and then finish a lighter woven fabric. I remove the currently unused left needle thread from the machine so that it doesn't get tangled with the other threads up in the looper while I'm sewing. I keep my differential feed on even transport, my stitch length at 3, my stitch width at about 5.5, and of course my knife is turned on. My thread tensions are all at 4 on both loopers and the right needle. As you can see, my stitch interlocking is right at the edge. The loopers lie flat, and we have the lower looper at the bottom and the upper looper at the top. Next, let's take a look at the rolled hem on the seams. We have inserted the right needle, and the right needle is also exactly right for the rolled hem. Sometimes in classes, I see ladies leave the left needle in the machine out of convenience. The result when the left needle is inserted but not threaded is significantly worse than if you simply remove the left needle because you do not need it. We sew with a 0.7 differential. This means that the back feed dog is a bit faster. First, we sew a cotton fabric, which becomes nice and tight as a result. If you were to sew on a differential even transport, meaning here at one, it could happen that it shrinks a bit. We make our stitch length very small, very short, and very close stitches in a row at. Our knife is of course up and our width is narrow. That means our knife is close to the needle and we have a nice narrow seam. The rolled hem is always used where you want a nice decorative finishing edge. The trick with the rolled hem is that your lower looper tension is increased and the lower looper pulls the upper looper around the edge. This means that you must definitely place the thread on the upper looper that you want to see significantly in your rolled hem because the upper looper is pulled around the edge by the lower looper. Therefore, you must also increase the lower looper tension. I have mine set to six now. Additionally, it is important for the rolled hem that you pull back your stitch width tongue to here at the front. That means you go from N from normal sewing to R to the rolled hem setting. 
This means that your stabilizer is no longer in your seam and thus, in combination with the increased lower looper tension, your fabric edge is turned over. Folded rolled hem is the correct name for what we want to do. Of course, we leave the stitch width tongue pulled back throughout the entire seam. I also see this sometimes when making the so-called overlock shell hem, where the stitch width tongue is sometimes pulled forward a bit, back forward, back forward. This is not a technique that the Gritzner 788 particularly likes. It can very easily happen that your stitch width tongue breaks, and this is definitely not a warranty case. We now sew a cotton fabric first and then look at the jersey. We leave the settings the same for both fabrics. With the jersey, we now see that it does not come out very wavy. If you want a wavy rolled hem, one that is really nicely swinging, then for many machines, including the Gritzner 788, it is not enough to simply put the differential in the lower range. It is pulled back a bit at the back, but it is not enough. That is why when I want a wavy rolled hem, I sew so that I pull a bit on my fabric at the front. With the overlock, you just have to be sure. If you manually pull at the front, then you also have to guide the fabric out of the machine at the back. That means you pull at the front and you pull at the back, and in principle, you have extended your sewing edge and guide the fabric under the feet along this extended edge. Afterwards, it has to wave because you have put much more thread on your extended edge than your edge would actually have been, and this thread doesn't know where to go and therefore lays itself in nice waves. If you only pull at the front and not at the back, then the danger of your needle breaking is high. And then here we have the result in the jersey, of course with a jersey needle. Here at the front you can see that the hem is significantly less wavy than at the back. This is because here at the front is where I only stretched with the differential, and here at the back where I also pulled manually. And here is the rolled hem with the cotton fabric again. You can see that it does not shrink at all. It lies completely flat. This is simply because it is completely sufficient for cotton to go just a little bit down with the differential so that it does not shrink. There is simply so much to say about the rolled hem, and there are so many eventualities. For one, it can be made in very different materials, ranging from thicker jersey to very thin organza. Then you can sew it with very different threads, from very thick to very thin, so from really thick decorative thread to embroidery thread. You can sew it with two threads and also three threads, but it could also be that unexpected problems arise, such as small lumps that stick out, or your child always pulls on the sleeve and the entire rolled hem stretches out. Also, how to make a rolled hem circular, for example, after you have already closed the sleeve, is of course a topic. That's why I made a whole video just about the rolled hem. A second one is currently in planning. And if you want to take a look at it, you can find it on T the Curly's page under the Tutorials tab. Finally, we look at the flat seam. First, let's discuss what the flat seam actually is. It is always sewn with a needle and can be used both as a finishing and connecting seam as well as a decorative stitch. Let's first see what it actually is. Imagine you have your seam here and your needle is at the level of my palm. That means the loopers are lying around it. The flat seam is called flat seam because it is pulled apart after sewing. So pay attention to my palm. You pull the seam apart afterwards and then you have either an undivas stitch on one side or on the other side the looper, which lays a very smooth seam on top of each other. That means the flat seam is called flat seam because it has no raised seam allowance at any point. You can sew the flat seam with two or three threads. It is not specified in your instruction manual. However, since you have the small converter, this auxiliary looper among the supplied accessories, we will now talk about it in connection with the flat seam. That means, first of all, we cut off the right needle thread and the upper looper and take them out of the machine. The presser foot is removed, and then we change the needle, putting it from the right side over to the left side. 
Personally, I really like the flat seam when it is particularly wide. Technically, you could also sew it with the right needle. When it comes to threading the machine, we have left the lower looper threaded and have not cut it off, so it is still in the machine. You can remove your upper looper thread and place your left needle thread or your needle threads on the cone of the needle you inserted. That means we have inserted the left needle, so we naturally also place our cone on the left needle thread position. We immediately attach the converter. First of all, we thread what is now on the machine because you cannot simply pass the needle through the normal tension. Let's remember how the flat seam is sewn. We want to pull it apart. To be able to do this, you need a nice loose needle thread. And we actually want exactly the opposite of what we want in a normal overlock seam because in a normal overlock seam, we don't want to see the left needle thread at all. But if our left needle thread is too tight here, you can't pull your seam apart. Sometimes it is like this. If you set the tension to zero on the Gritzner 788, it is sometimes actually very loose. However, on most machines, it always has a certain residual tension. You should actually be able to press the tension release button continuously on the side here so that your thread simply slides loosely through your tension wheel at the needle all the time. Of course, you cannot do that. That's why I'm always a fan of simple solutions. You take a piece of scotch tape and stick it over the tension channel from your tension. so that the needle thread now goes up here into the pretension, then runs over the scotch tape, then normally down behind the silver holder and continues its normal path up to the needle eye. Next, we attach the converter. At one corner, it has a small elevation, which must be inserted from behind into the upper looper hole. That means you lever it into this narrow gap. It must stick out a little bit at the back. Then you push the front part back so that it snaps into the hole from behind. You have to make sure that it is really in the hole and not underneath it. To release the converter later, simply push the front part back slightly, lever it up and out to the front. We place our fabric right sides together because we want to see the ladder stitch. That is the pink thread on the right side. We have zero tension on the left needle for pulling apart because it runs over the scotch tape. And we have the tension on the lower looper set to five. The upper looper is not used as we have the converter. And the other settings, we have the differential set to even feed, the stitch length set just over three, the stitch width set just over five. And of course the knife is switched on. Switched on means running. And what we get out of the machine looks like this. And when we pull it apart, our needle thread appears here. This is what it looks like from the right side and from the left side. Of course, you can also sew the flat seam with three threads whenever it may need to be a little more durable. You can also sew the flat seam with only the right needle if it should be significantly narrower and you can use it in both thinner and thicker fabrics. There are many, many things you can do with the flat seam. For example, you can attach ribbons or lace with it. Of course, you can also sew the cord threads onto the needles, such as Madeira number 12 shown here. You can use it as a raglan seam, or you can also use it for bindings if you don't have a cover or if bindings with your cover don't work. All these different variants would again exceed the scope of this video, which is why I have made two different videos. One is basics of the flat seam which is only about the technique of setting up your machine, handling different fabrics, and how to adjust your machine accordingly. And in the second video, Applications of the Flat Seam, it's all about the different variants which foot you need to achieve a certain result. This brings us directly to our next topic because now we turn to the feet. We re-thread the machine for the four thread overlock stitch and start using the blind hem foot. Sewing a blind hem is actually not difficult. In haute couture, it is often sewn by hand because the goal of a blind hem is to sew the hem so tightly that the thread used to sew it is not visible on the right side. The advantage of using the overlock machine is that you can sew and finish the edge at the same time. The difficulty of using the overlock machine is that you have to be careful not to stitch through all the layers of fabric with the left needle, otherwise the thread will be visible on the right side. When I sew a blind hem, I first fold up my hem, measure it, and pin it in place. 
Then when I take it to the overlock machine, I position it just like this. The original fold is laid out flat, then I fold it up and take the entire folded edge to the overlock machine. This is where the fold is, and this is where we will sew our finishing stitch. The key is to catch only a small part of the fold with the left needle. This is where our blind hem foot comes in handy. The foot has a screw that, when loosened, allows you to move the front guide closer or further away from the knife. The further away it is from the knife, the closer it is to the back needle since we have a fold in the front. You push your folded hem against this front edge. What we want to finish is under this foot. You can use this foot for many other things, but to sew a blind hem, I move the foot as far as possible to the right and tighten the screw. Then I put the fabric in. Here you can see the seam allowance of the hem, which will be trimmed by the knife and caught by the upper and lower loopers and the right needle. You can see the left needle better from this position, which is straight in line with the fold. If your fabric is thinner, you can move the guide a bit further to the right. I moved it all the way to the left because the fabric is thick. The fabric is then squeezed between the foot and the feed dog, stretched out when it's under the needles, and then caught by the left needle. It's crucial to push the fabric forward with these two fingers because it's only resting on a small area. It is always located under the open knife. If you don't push it forward, the foot won't catch it properly. This can happen easily, so you need to be careful to stay in the guide. You need to check the finished hem to ensure it's secure. You can test this by pulling the seam allowance and the fold apart. It should hold. When you look at the right side, you should see as little as possible of the needle thread. Ideally nothing. I used white thread on the left needle so you could see the stitches if they were visible. but it's perfectly matched. You can't see anything. There's one more thing I want to point out. I only noticed it when I cut the fabric in close up on the computer, which is one of the reasons why many people love Curly's videos. There's a small hole here. This hole is 100% due to me using universal needles when I changed the needles to stretch or jersey needles. Universal needles make holes in stretchy fabrics. Now you might wonder why I had universal needles in the machine. It's simple. I quickly sewed this sample for you at the end of the flat seam, and it's made of woven fabric. But if we look at our blind hem, we see that it's truly a blind hem, and it's firmly sewn on the inside. I can't remove it. It's really secure. That's how a blind hem should look like. Next, let's take a look at the elastic foot, which is sometimes also called the rubber band foot. 
The advantage of the elastic foot is that you can sew a stretchy band with absolutely uniform stretch, and that is super helpful, for example, if you want to sew leggings. You don't have to sew only elastic, but you can sew elastic in all widths. You can also use Fram Elastic. I have transparent elastic here. Another word for it would be Framelon. Before we feed it into the machine, let's take a look at how the foot is constructed so that you know exactly how the part works. We have a screw on the foot. With this screw, you regulate how strong the pressure of the roller is on this lower plate. That's where you'll be inserting your stretchy band. If the roller presses heavily on the plate, you can't lift the roller at all. If your elastic band were in between, it would be held back extremely strongly and would therefore have a very strong stretch. The less your roller presses on your plate, the less strong your stretch is. Now to insert the elastic band, we loosen the screw enough but you have to be careful not to accidentally turn it completely out of the foot. Then you take your elastic band or the band with which you want to stretch and lay it flat underneath. It can be right here at the edge, but you lay it underneath. And it's important that there's still enough of the band sticking out here at the back. This will help you position it correctly. Now you lift the foot and simply slide your elastic band into the foot from the side here at the front. It's important that your band is definitely all the way up to the edge here. And if we look at it from below now, you can see that your lower edge is definitely underneath. Then we tighten the screw a bit. You can also do this in a round closed state if you've already closed your elastic band to the hem, for example. But we'll take a look at it now while it's open. You have to make sure that your elastic band stays under your foot. And sometimes it happens that your foot doesn't snap when you lower the presser foot. Then you press the button here at the back. It did it directly now, but it can happen that the first time you have to push the foot or the holder up a little onto the foot. Then you lift your presser foot once and check if your elastic foot or elastic foot comes up with it. And now you position your band correctly straight under the foot so that it ends flush with the foot on the right side and first put your foot down. Then you slide your fabric with the right side down and now slide it sideways under the foot. That means lift the presser foot elastic band here at the front. Of course, this is a bit more difficult with such a wide elastic band than with a narrow one. That means the fabric has to be pushed under the foot properly. And both have to end cleanly at the edge on the right. I like to sew it in the knife. That means I don't cut my fabric but sew it so that I'm basically guiding the fabric along the inside edge of the knife. Otherwise, you would have to start differently so that you don't sew diagonally into your fabric. And then you regulate your screw. That means you adjust how strong you want the stretch to be. To get the right stretch for your project, I can only recommend that you sew a few tens of centimeters long pieces and always with a different stretch so that you can test exactly how much elastic band you need to end up with the right measurement. And then you actually do nothing else but step on the gas. The machine is threaded in a four thread overlock seam. All tensions are at four. I don't have to pull on the fabric or the elastic band now. But what I like to do is hold my rubber band here at the back and check if it's really being transported back with it. Since the elastic band is now being pulled apart more or less strongly while sewing, I have entered a stitch length of four. Because my stitches are always very close together anyway because they are pulled apart while sewing and then spring back. 
and then I have a very short stitch length. Now you can see here when I start sewing, my roller presses so hard on my elastic band that it doesn't want to go through properly. That's why it's very important that you focus on keeping your elastic band to the right side. If necessary, pull it a little over here at the edge. And of course, at the same time, you have to make sure that your fabric stays smooth along the edge. That means, in other words, you sew like this. Elastic band to the right, fabric to the left. Exaggerated. Of course, both have to stay at the edge. Looks like this in practice. First, both layers have to be captured, rubber and fabric. So now I can start here. And the result looks like this from the inside. Of course, the fabric was on top with the wrong side up. And from the other side, it looks like this. And if you stretch it now, you could sew over it again and then have a wonderfully wide leggings waistband. The next technique we will look at is gathering with the overlock machine. The advantage of gathering with the overlock is, of course, that you sew and finish in one step. We can see here the underlock seam. Logically, they are wise. And we can see here the upper looper and thus the needle threads. We have sewn and finished the fabric in one piece. If you want to achieve a clean overlock finish without trailing loops, which is particularly important when attaching a neckband, for example. I have explained exactly how to do this in the video, better sewing with the overlock. You will also find some other sewing techniques with the overlock, such as creating clean outer corners on muslin cloths with a rolled hem, creating a clean rolled hem finish at the end of a cloth, creating clean inner corners, and much more. It is important that you always let your cutter run because if you come to the right side of the cutter, that is, beyond the cutting interface to the right, then you run the risk of damaging your grippers. So you always let your cutter run. To gather, there is this gathering foot. And the gathering feet are designed or characterized by the fact that they consist of two layers. The layer you want to gather is guided here at the very bottom between this plate and the feeder. And the layer that should not be gathered, which should remain smooth, is placed here at the top of the foot and does not touch our feeder at all. In this example, the dark blue fabric was, of course, at the bottom and the ungathered fabric was at the top and the fabrics were naturally placed right sides together because you want your seam to be on the inside. Regarding the machine settings, we have threaded the four thread overlock stitch, increased the tensions on the needles and reduced them on the grippers. And on our side, we have a very wide stitch. We have a very long stitch. Our cutter is of course switched on and our differential is set to two. What exactly does differential in two inches mean? Behind, the rear feeder is only half as fast as the front one, and the fabrics are pushed together to the maximum. You can regulate your gathering strength precisely with two components on the machine, and that is, on the one hand, by reducing your stitch length or by lowering your differential a little further to 1.8 or 1.5. The more you go towards even transport, the less strong your gathering will be but you can also influence or not influence your gathering strength with a third component. Because the thicker your fabric is, the worse it responds to the feeder or the differential. So if you have a thick fabric, you can't gather it very well because it hardly responds to the differential. And if you have a very thin fabric like a cotton or a batiste or organza, then you can gather it very nicely.
The foot is a bit difficult to attach to the machine because it is relatively high, so you have to press it down a little bit, lower the presser foot, and snap it into this small groove. The blue fabric below must be longer than the fabric above to prevent the fabrics from slipping under the feet when you release the fabric, turn the hand wheel a little towards you until the needles hold the fabric in place. And then all you have to do is guide your fabric so that they run evenly next to the cutter. If you come a little to the right, that's not a problem because they will run under the cutter. And this is how the fabrics come out of your machine. Of course, there are ways to gather fixed lengths to fixed lengths. You then divide both your hem and your ruffle into equal sections, and you cannot work quite as strongly with the differential. Or you can do some sewing samples to test exactly how strong your particular fabric responds to the stitch length and differential settings. Another great technique you can do with your overlock machine is piping. Piping refers to a raised area on the fabric, usually in a slightly different color, which sometimes also adds a bit of structure. The advantage of using an overlock machine for piping is that you can create a stretchy piping. That means you can use it to edge the lower part of a sleeve, for example. You can also sew it into the seam at the top edge of your collar or into the front edge of a hood, and so on. There are many possibilities where you can use piping. You can of course make piping yourself, you can also pipe around corners, you can pipe in a circular shape, and so on. I have made a whole video about piping, where I show you all these things. Here, however, I will definitely show you how to use your piping foot. The special thing about your piping foot, as so often, is on the back. On the back we have a groove. And through this groove your piping flows. If you want to pipe, you definitely need a foot with this groove. Your piping runs through this groove. If you were to pipe with a foot without this groove, the smooth sole would lie on your piping and the foot would hang in the air to the right and left. This means that you have a very, very poor or no transport to the back. The machine is set to even feed differential. My stitch length is relatively long, three to four. My stitch width is also relatively wide because we don't want to cut into the seam allowance of the piping. It should definitely run through cleanly, and for that we need enough space. At the same time, when the piping is unfolded, we definitely don't want to see the left needle thread. Our knife is turned on and our machine is threaded with a four thread overlock stitch, and all thread tensions are set to four. Attach the foot to the machine, then place the first layer of fabric with the wrong side down. The right side faces upwards. The fabric is of course under the knife. Place the piping on top of this fabric. The seam allowance of the piping is turned to the right and ideally touches the knife on the inside. Then place the second layer of fabric with the right side down on top of the piping and the first layer of fabric. That means the two fabrics are right sides together and the piping is exactly in the middle. It is important that your piping protrudes a little behind the foot, because if your machine does not transport all three layers to the back from the first stitch, you have the possibility to manually transport the first stitches a little to the back by holding onto the piping behind the foot. In addition, you always use your left middle and ring finger to transport all layers evenly to the back.
And this is what the result looks like. At the end of the video, I'll take you deep into my own world and we'll take a look at the pearl and sequin foot. In this world, there are no conventions anymore. There are no predetermined tensions and nothing is as it should be. There is only the plan in my head of how things should end up and the technical machine, the overlock machine, which functions exactly as it should. That means we're looking at the pearl and sequin foot. And this foot actually caused me a big problem because I couldn't decide which of the many techniques to show you that you can do with the pearl and sequin foot. With this foot, we not only have a selection of different stitches, such as rolled hem, overlock stitch, flat lock stitch, left needle, right needle, two thread, three thread, but we also have a wide selection of different ribbons. So I started by putting the machine in the three thread flat lock stitch. This is the stitch we didn't look at earlier. I displayed the settings above. It's important that you use the exact same thread thicknesses when you adopt these settings. I used embroidery thread on the left needle, Madeira number 12 on the upper looper, and Serafil on the lower looper. Serafil is a very thin silk thread or polyester thread that is used specifically on the overlock machine to sew silk, organza, batiste, and other fabrics. You can also use it to sew on the bobbin thread if you have an embroidery machine. I did that for years, and it works great. If you don't have an external thread stand, you put it here on your overlock, go through the bracket at the top, put your embroidery machine next to it, come up here, go through the spool of your embroidery machine, and then wind it. It really works great. I used it on the lower looper with the settings you see above, and the result is this stitch. You can see exactly where each thread is. Here's my left needle thread, here's my upper looper, and here just slightly at the edge is my lower looper. Then, because we want to look at the pearl and sequin foot, I ran some sequin ribbon through it. It looks great, but because the thread is too thick, you can only see a little bit of the sequin, so it's not really suitable for here and now. After that, I replaced the thick Madeira decorative thread with the embroidery thread that is now on top and ran this ribbon, a satin gift ribbon, through the foot. It looked good, but not perfect, because I had too much space on the side where you could see the fabric. Then I brought my needle to the right position, that means out on the left, in on the right, and did the same thing again, and then told this stitch here. I liked it pretty well, but it looked a little too simple to me. So I set the machine to rolled hem, and because I was in the flat lock stitch before, I just left my tape where it was. here at the right needle and only set my two loopers to the rolled hem. That means I set this pearl ribbon with an extremely loose right needle thread. And you can see that here at the bottom because we have this kind of zigzag. If you want to do something like this and you want your pearl ribbon to hang completely down like that, then you have to put a little tension on your needle. I liked it, but it wasn't enough for me. So now, I want to show you how to sew a sequin ribbon onto a jersey as a finishing touch. And we want it to be wavy. That means you put in your right needle, then you set your machine exactly as I have it now. However, I have no tension on the right needle, my tape is still there, and the thread runs over it. You pull back your stitch width tongue because we want to make a rolled hem. And your settings here on the side are differential at 0 0.7 so that everything stretches nicely. But we still pull on the jersey. Then I set a very long stitch. By now you'll realize that we're not following any conventions anymore because we're making a rolled hem with a pulled back stitch width tongue but we still have a long stitch because we don't want to puncture our sequin, otherwise it will fall off. The knife is definitely switched off because otherwise it would hit against the foot from below. You can't sew with the pearl and sequin foot if the knife is switched on, and our stitch width is set to rolled hem. 
The special thing about the pearl and sequin foot is that it has this groove and you can run all sorts of ribbons through it. That means, regardless of whether you have sequin ribbon, pearl ribbon, satin ribbon, a shoelace, or anything else, you can run everything through this foot. You put the foot on the machine, pass your sequin ribbon through the opening, and lever it under the back part of the foot, and insert it into the groove at the front. Then you place your fabric with the right side up and make a few cautious stitches first. You have to make sure that your fabric definitely ends here at the side with the foot. The plan for the first two or three cautious stitches is to capture your fabric with the threads. Now we're in. Now the fabric is connected to the sequin ribbon. Now you take your sequin ribbon at the back, and I have my fabric between my two fingers here. And through my two fingers, I let the sequin ribbon run. I'm getting a little closer now, and I pull the jersey for a long time, lay it down. And you have to come from below here. It's important that you take out your fabric from the back. You mustn't pull it, but you have to take it with a little tension. A sequin ribbon always has two sides. Of course, you lay it so that the right side faces up, so that you don't see this seam, but of course you could also see it. It's all a matter of taste. Before we wrap up, I'll quickly show you how to keep your machine clean. The better you keep it clean, and the more often you oil it, the longer you will enjoy using it. Remove the waste bin, open the machine, and unscrew the stitch plate. It's important to only remove this screw and not the small one next to it. Take off the entire stitch plate and brush the inside with the small brush removing all the dust. Once the dust is gone, but really only when it's gone, put a small drop of oil on this spot of the upper looper. Then you can close the machine, replace the waste bin, and continue sewing. I hope you had fun and learned a lot. Not just about your machine, but also about sewing in general. On Curly's Facebook page, I like to showcase other techniques, new processing methods, different threads, and everything related to overlocking and covering. There's also always news to be found on the homepage and the blog. And if you always want to be up to date, I would be very happy if you subscribe to the newsletter. You'll find the lady with the newspaper right on the homepage. Similarly, on the homepage, you'll find the freebies category at the top. And under freebies, you'll not only find occasional free videos, but also this one. You can add it to your account for zero euros directly through the shopping cart. You can find your video account here under My Curlies and your videos under the category Video Library or My Videos. The advantage of the videos here is that you can jump from chapter to chapter and don't have to scroll through the entire video if you need a specific topic. Just click on the subject and you'll land in the video right where you're interested. 
All that's left for me to do is to say thank you, twice. First, to Stoff and Liebe, who kindly provided us with fabrics for this video. And personally, I also want to thank the company Gritzner for trusting me to make this video. I wish you lots of fun sewing and success. And maybe we'll see each other again someday. See you soon. Bye.